and talk about some risks. With type 2 diabetes, you have up to four times greater risk of stroke, heart attack, or death. Even at your A1C go, you're still at risk, which if ignored could bring you here. May put you in one of those. Or even worse, too much? That's the point. Get real about your risks and do something about it. Talk to your healthcare provider about ways to lower your risk of stroke, heart attack, or death. Learn more at GetRealAboutDiabetes.com. We just kind of threw a whole new take on it, but it works. Tomorrow on ET, Dolly Parton dishes on her New Year's co-hosting gig with goddaughter Miley. Plus, our Alyssa Milano exclusive, the latest on the Who's the Boss reboot. It is as progressive as it was then. It's going to be really great. I'm just fascinated to see that. There is more to life than <laughs> what... Happening now. The one that got away on the stand today telling jurors how she nearly became victim number five. We're in the courtroom as a former Border Patrol agent faces charges in the murders of four women. Plus, one of the mothers of a victim in the Uvalde shooting filing a new lawsuit, who all she's going after to get justice for her daughter. Next. Another round of fog and drizzle on the way. I'll let you know when that's going to impact your commute and big temperature swings on the way. I'll help you prepare. The News at 5 starts right now. She is the one that allegedly escaped, taking the stand today, testifying against a former Border Patrol agent accused of killing four women near Laredo. Juan David Ortiz, accused in those murders. They happened back in 2018. Murders that the DA in Webb County is calling an act of a vigilante. The trial gaining national attention, so much so a judge granted a change of venue to the Alamo City last summer. Erica Hernandez live at the Cadena Reeves Justice Center with testimony from a woman who claims she was almost victim number five, Erica. Yeah, Steve, that key witness is Erica Pena. She was allegedly attacked by Ortiz back in 2018. Benya, the only surviving victim, but her credibility under question today. Now, we'll, before we get to her testimony, a little bit about Ortiz. He was arrested after being accused of murdering four sex workers, those murders taking place in a span of two weeks. And all the victims were found near I-35, just north of Laredo. Benya nervously took the stand today and mentioned that she knew Ortiz and that he had been a client of hers on several occasions. She says she was he was usually nice and often bought her drugs. But on the night of September 14, 2018, she says after being at his home, his demeanor changed. He then drove her to get food at a gas station, and that is where she says he attacked her. As soon as he uh, took out the gun, he just stared at me, didn't say anything. Some way, somehow, I took off running without a shirt. Now, she went on to say she ran to that gas station where a DPS trooper was gassing up his vehicle. Benya was able to tell them that Ortiz had attacked her, and she believed he was also behind the murders of her friends Melissa Ramirez and Claudine Luera. Benya, an admitted heroin and crack user, at times seemed confused or got frustrated on the stand. During the cross-examination, the defense tried to attack her credibility and memory of what happened. Now, coming up at 6, we'll hear more from Benya's testimony. Now, this trial is expected to last for about two weeks here in San Antonio. Testimony will continue tomorrow morning. You can watch it live on KSAT.com, KSAT Plus, and our KSAT YouTube channel. Live at the Kadena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Erica. Eliana Cruz Torres, one of the 21 victims who died at Robb Elementary six months ago. Now her mother, Sandra Torres, taking action by suing several police departments, the Uvalde School District, and the gun maker. The federal lawsuit filed today, it accused those named of a, quote, complete failure to follow the active shooter protocols, along with violations of the victim's constitutional rights by leaving them inside two classrooms with the gunman for more than an hour. Torres is being helped by the Every Town for Gun Safety Group. Typically, gun makers are immune under federal law from lawsuits. However, the families of the victims from Sandy Hook won a $73 million settlement from the gun maker in their case. A holiday manhunt is over after four days of searching. San Antonio police have now hauled in the man accused of shooting his girlfriend to death 
on Thanksgiving. 24-year-old Paris Shaw, now in the Bear County Jail, facing an aggravated assault with a deadly weapon charge, as well as causing serious bodily injury and some other charges as well. The shooting happened just before midnight at a home on Barbed Wire Pass, not too far from 1604 and Shanefell Road. Take a look at this daylight video of the scene. When BCSO deputies arrived there, they found the front door open and they heard someone who was struggling to breathe. That's when they found the victim, Shaw's girlfriend, on the couch bleeding. She was taken to University Hospital and placed on life support, support rather, and died yesterday. His bond set at $232,000. Tonight at 6, Alicia Barrero spoke to one homeowner about their close encounter with the suspect, seen here and why his charge could be upgraded. A man hired to teach young girls gymnastics at a summer camp now facing charges of sexual assault. This is according to the Bernie Police Department. 74 year old Michael Spiller taken into custody on November 18th. The allegations of sexual assault and molestation go back to 2001 to present day from multiple cities. The most recent being a girl about 12 to 13 years of age who attended his circus arts for kids camp at the Bernie Gymnastics Center. The victim came forward to police and claims there are several other victims. Anyone who was harmed or has additional information about this man or this case asked to call Bernie police at 830-249-8645. By the way, the Bernie Gymnastics Center refused to comment on these allegations tonight. Just three minutes ago, City Council closing the application process to find a temporary replacement for Clayton Perry. He's the District 10 council member on a sabbatical after being charged in a hit and run crash. He's charged with DWI now, as well as failure to stop and give information in that crash. For two weeks, the city's been accepting applications and now that selection process is beginning. On Wednesday, council members chose up to or will choose up to three people to interview. They're, they're going to interview those folks on Thursday. Whoever selected for the temporary post will begin immediately. In the meantime, Perry's arraignment hearing is scheduled for December 12th. And millions under a boil order notice. The boil order in Houston expected to last until tomorrow. This after two transformers at a water treatment plant went offline. Robert Arnold reports from Houston asking officials there why there were not more safety guards in place to prevent something like this from happening again and just how long Houstonians will have to boil their water. When we heard a power outage is what caused the problems at this water purification plant, our first question was, aren't there backup generators here? The answer is yes, but according to the city, a call has to be made to turn those on. I have instructed Public Works uh, to do an overall review of our system, a diagnostic review, uh, to see how we prevent this from happening again. A bad cell is being blamed for taking out the East Water Purification Plant's main transformer and backup transformer. That caused water pressure to drop to critical levels. When pressure drops below a certain level, contaminants can creep into our water. I'm not the technical person. I can't tell you why both fail. The facility is equipped with backup generators, but the city has to ask NRG to turn on those generators. The city did not make that call, saying the loss of power was an internal problem, not a loss of power from the grid. You have the grid providing power and you have your generators to step in. When these two transformers fail, it prevented the power uh, to the system. We then ask if the system is equipped to instantly provide backup power so there is no disruption. Uh, we, we had, you know, state of, you know, practice uh, redundancy built into our system, but we're going we're gonna to push ourselves to go beyond that and ask those questions. Public Works officials say at this point there are no indications contaminants made it into our drinking water. The mayor says the boil water notice was done out of an abundance of caution. I think they did the right thing in issuing this uh, um, uh, basically a uh, warning. Rice University engineering professor Pedro Alvarez is an expert on water treatment systems. Alvarez says since the water pressure never reached zero and was not below critical thresholds for very long, the risk is minimal. I would consider this a warning or a, that underscores the need for a more resilient system. Reporting from Houston, Robert Arnold, KSAT 12 News.
Another archaeological dig beginning at Alamo Plaza. They're trying to find out if there's anything left to the Alamo Mission's south wall. It's all part of the Alamo Redevelopment Project. Today, crews put up fencing at Alamo Plaza. The dig itself will be southwest of the Alamo Church. It's part of a $400 million redevelopment coordinated by the city, the state, and a trust. Other digs like this have uncovered artifacts and adobe walls beneath the plaza. It's expected to take about six weeks. It won't impact visitor activities at the historic plaza, though. What a day today. Bright sunshine temperatures mostly in the 70s. Lakey 72 degrees, 73 in Warren's backyard in Del Rio. You go 75 near Lavernia, 68 meanwhile in Windcrest and 70 in Mico. A beautiful day today, but some big changes are coming. I think even shortly after sunset this evening, turning cloudy, not just cloudy, but damp fog, drizzle, sprinkles later on tonight, probably even by 9, 10 p.m. and reduced visibility for the morning commute tomorrow. We actually have a few rounds of morning fog and drizzle, big temperature changes and big swings in humidity to talk about. I'll help you plan all out the rest of your week in just a bit. I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom, and here's what we're working on for the news at six o'clock today. A program that helps families thrive from pregnancy to toddler years is now at risk for losing federal funding. A local mother tells us why this program is crucial to family success locally and as well as across the country. And honoring a local civil rights icon coming up at six o'clock, RJ Marquez tells us how the legacy of Emma Tenayuka will live on forever after her work and activism on the West Side. That and more today on the News at Six. See you then. Thank you, Myra. Well, there are only two days left, which means two more days after today of these beards and scruff and two more days to reach our goal of $20,000 raised for the No Shave November campaign. So far, Team KSAT has raised more than $18,000 to help fight cancer. Thank you to all of you. We're just a little more than $1,000 short of our goal. Right now, we are the number one team on the leaderboard nationally, surpassing second place by $10,000. Remember, all the money raised will go to Cancer Foundations to research, prevention, and treatment. The last day to donate will be this Wednesday. Looking good. Imagine getting a surgery that you didn't actually need. That situation not as rare as you might think. We're gonna tell you the ways to know when and when not to take your doctor's recommendation. At first deals in stores, now deals online, both still affected by high prices caused by inflation. Why experts still expect sales to hit record highs. And taking a look outside with your traffic authority, we've got I-35 at Randolph, back in business and moving slow at this rush hour after Thanksgiving. For a serious medical condition, surgery is often a lifesaver, but a new report is showing that doctors are performing tens of thousands of unnecessary procedures as well. 12 Under Sides Marilyn Moritz with some advice on how to have a very frank discussion with your doctor. During the first 10 months of the pandemic, when most cities were locked down, Medicare was billed for more than 100,000 overused and unnecessary surgeries or procedures, according to the nonprofit Lown Institute. 45,000 stents for coronary heart disease, 16,000 vertebroplasties for osteoporosis, and 14,000 hysterectomies for benign disease. In some instances, these are life-saving procedures. However, in a number of cases, a patient's condition could also be well-managed with a less invasive treatment that was just as effective. Take the 13,000 spinal fusions the study found unnecessary. The procedure can be successful, but experts say for mild to moderate back pain, it's often no more effective than, say, physical therapy. If your doctor recommends surgery, Consumer Reports says have an honest talk about the benefits and risks. Start with two questions. If your parent or child had this condition, would you recommend this procedure? This forces your doctor to sort of take a moment and pause. It also helps them 
and connect to what you're experiencing as a patient. And what are the alternatives? You want to know, for instance, if there are other appropriate options that may be less invasive, have fewer potential side effects, or require less healing time. And before any major procedure, consider getting a second opinion. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. As some started this morning, others maybe while we were at work, we're talking Cyber Monday, which is today. Spending expected to top $11 billion. The deepest discounts expected to be on TVs, laptops, beauty products. As for what not to buy today on Cyber Monday, experts say wait on mattresses and furniture. A huge factor looming over the holiday season, of course, inflation at a 40 year high. The Federal Reserve has raised interest rates six times this year to cool down the economy and bring down spending, putting pressure on retailers to sell as much as they can right now. We want to take a live look with Sky 12 right over the botanical gardens before they all light up for the holidays. It's always a great time of the year to go visit there. Yeah, you know, Lightscape is open there. Yeah. I actually went a couple Sundays ago when it was really chilly. Yeah, but they had s'more stations. They had hot Ooh, chocolate. Nice. I mean, they are equipped for all kinds of weather out there. They know how to do it, yeah, they do. right? Yeah, they're prepared for it. And <laughs> you're going to have to be well equipped the rest of this week for all kinds of weather as well. I mean, take a look at our headlines here. Damp tomorrow morning with the fog and drizzle that will have some big swings in our humidity and big temperature swings as well this week with high temperatures ranging from the 50s to near 80. So let's help you plan out the rest of your week, starting with late tonight and early tomorrow morning, hitting the roads for the morning commute tomorrow. You will notice the fog, the drizzle, the sprinkles and reduced visibility. I mean, I think as early as 9 p.m. we could have some fog drizzle and reduced visibility, but notice our future cast here. 5 a.m. tomorrow visibilities of a mile or less in some instances and that that goes through the entire morning commute visibility is reduced and not really improving until we get to about 10 a.m. in the morning. So late tonight through 10 a.m. tomorrow anticipate the dampness on the roads and of course the reduced visibility. One reason is because of the influx of moisture and humidity. I know it's not overly muggy right now, but that's going to change very quickly this evening and through tomorrow. Notice our dew point trend here. Tuesday dew points well into the 60s. OK, so back to the muggy conditions just for one day. Then a cold front sweeps away the humidity for Wednesday and Thursday. No fog those mornings. But once the humidity returns again Friday and Saturday, I think we'll have some uh, I'll, we'll have more rounds of morning fog at that point. So anticipate the periodic fog and drizzle throughout this week, starting tomorrow morning. All right, let's talk temperatures. Notice that cooler air to the north, 20s to near 40. This is going to get mixed with this warmer air down to the south. Uh, here in Texas, mostly 60s and 70s, but a system's going to mix it all together in the midsection of the country, and some of that cooler air will get pulled southward, and that's going to help give us our big temperature spread in the days ahead. So let's talk about it right now. Pleasant, comfortable, 74 Converse, 75 Castroville, hello to 71. Officially at the airport, we're checking in at 73 degrees tomorrow morning. Most of us in the 60s, some upper 50s as you get into the hill country. Comfort 55, Bandera 57, but I think low to mid 60s in San Antonio. Then by tomorrow afternoon, right near 80 degrees. That's before the cooler air makes it here. I mean, we're talking 80 on the west side, Seguin 80 degrees, Bolverde about 77, Divine 80. Notice Wednesday after the cold front. We're down to 60 degrees for the high temperature. And then Thursday, we're looking at highs in the mid 50s. We go from 70s today, 80 tomorrow, back down into the 50s by Thursday. So get ready for those temperature swings. You'll want to have the jackets ready to go again by Wednesday and especially on Thursday. Then temperatures, of course, rebound a little bit as we get into the upcoming weekend. Here's the big picture and it's quite across the state. We just have some high clouds off in the panhandle and some low clouds that'll continue to build in from the coast. But the main action is coming together in the western US This trough in the upper level flow. That's going to dig and really help stir up a storm system in the midsection of the country, and that's going to pull that cooler air southward. That'll be making it here by the middle part of the week, and it'll drop the humidity as well for the middle part of the week. Quick update. We're still the second driest year to date on record here in San Antonio. 11.03 inches and we 
definitely distance the gap from 1917, which is the driest year. It's good to see that, but actual rain chances, pretty slim. We're just looking at 20% and it's mainly just sprinkles to light activity for a few days in the seven day forecast. Fog and drizzle tomorrow morning, a few hundredths of an inch, maybe that's it, 64 degrees at 7 a.m. By noon, we start to see sunshine at 75, 80 for the high temperature, noticeable humidity. Wednesday, windy, but much cooler at 60 degrees uh, with the lower humidity. Then the clouds move back in Friday morning. Another round of fog and drizzle with a high temperature of 70 and overall no really good rain chances. Just that dampness that we deal with. All right, Adam. Thank you. All right. So it's championship week. It for sure is runners. for UTSA and they need your help. They want to get as many people in that Alamo Dome as possible because they're taking on their rivals, North Texas. When we come back, how can that happen? They will appeal to you. And will the Brennan Bears end the longest win streak in Texas high school football history? Coming up. The UTSA Roadrunners have faced their rivals the Mean Green of North Texas this Friday night in the Animal Dome to decide the Conference USA Championship. This is the second straight season. The Roadrunners have hosted the Conference USA title game. They're beating Western Kentucky last season 49-41. Now they will try for back-to-back -back championships after running the table in league play for the first time in school history and after the largest comeback on record in their 34-31 victory over UTEP after being down 24 to nothing. As a result, the Roadrunners are now number three in the latest Associated Press College football rankings and will be facing North Texas for the second time this season after winning their first meeting back in October 31-27 in the final seconds. Head coach Jeff Trailer feels the Roadrunners need all the support they can get come this Friday and wants to break their Alamo Dome record that right now stands at 56,743 set back in 2011 in their first game of their first ever season. We need the city to show up. I mean, we, we got, it's got to be like tonight times two for us to have a, a competitive chance. And we worked hard to get that home field. We can't waste it, man. We cannot waste it. So we, we need to get this place packed. We, we should be shooting for the record. I mean, come on. It's the second consecutive championship at home. This is hard to do, man. Know what we got to do, but we got to get 50,000 people in here. If I got to go around the town, whatever it takes, we got to get them here. All right, kickoff in the dome with the number 23 ranked team in the nation set for 6.30 p.m. Friday night, and tickets are already on sale. Brennan Bears trying to become the first team to end the nation's longest win streak in high school football when they hosted Westlake Chaparrales from Austin in the Alamo Dome this Saturday at 2. The Chap streak now stands at 53 straight victories following their 44-7 win over San Benito to improve their record this season at 13-0. Now Brennan stands in the way at 12-1 following the Bears' big win over the other Austin powerhouse Lake Travis 34-17. Now these two clash to find out who advances the Class 6A Division I state semifinals. Just, you know, come out and execute. We got to play a hard game, a tough game versus a really good team. You know, they're a nationally ranked team. Um, but we think we can, uh, if we go out and execute, we can get the job done. We know we can do it, and we, we, we have the, the expectations to, and we have the players and the, the skill, skill guys, but we just have to be there mentally, and we have to be there physically, and, and, and just be there, be, be on top of our game. And there's another place that could use a lot of fan support as well because Westlake travels very well. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back. Turning damp, drizzly, and foggy tonight. That'll last through the morning commute. Then we clear out and have a lot of sunshine by tomorrow afternoon, making it up to 80 degrees. By Thursday, we're back down in the 50s for high, so get ready for big temperature swings. Thank you, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 5 with us. World News up next. We'll see you back here at 6.